George and Lee think that the fetus, the embryo, is a person with rights, and so it is wrong to kill it, according to George and Lee, and so abortion is impermissible. We see now their argument, uh, or why they think the uh, embryo is a person, and we've seen how they would respond to those pro-choice thinkers or positions that would hold that the fetus, the embryo, is not a person, right? Uh, that was the argument we considered in the previous video. <clears throat> but we know that there are pro-choice arguments that grant personhood to the fetus and argue that abortion is nonetheless morally permissible, in particular Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument. And so Having established, if we think their arguments work, having established that the fetus is a person, they still haven't fully secured the pro-life position. They need to respond to something like Thompson's argument. That's what George and Lee do next. So let's see how they respond to Thompson's argument. So again, I have the kind of diagram that we've been looking at of uh, Thompson's violinist thought experiment. Um, for uh, that's what uh, George and Lee d discussed. That that's what Thompson's paper is most famous for, as we've uh, as I've mentioned already. You could substitute in her other thought experiments, the People Seeds one, right? And it'd be the same. They'd make the same kind of objection. Um, but we're just going to focus on the violinist. Okay. So very quick, right? But the way Thompson's argument works, she tells this story about the violinist. You're kidnapped. You wake up in bed, hooked into the violinist. If you don't stay hooked up for nine months, he'll die. <clears throat> Are you allowed to unplug yourself? Thompson says, yes, very clearly you can unplug yourself. That's the intuition she draws out of, from, uh, out of that thought experiment. It's morally permissible to unplug yourself. And then she says, because the violinist scenario and pregnancy are relevantly analogous, right? Just as it's permissible to unplug yourself from the violinist, so too is it permissible to unplug from the fetus, so to speak. That is to say, abortion is morally permissible. The details are more complex than this, but whatever, we already covered it. There's your quick overview of Thompson's argument. So, Part of her argument and what really makes it kind of unique and striking is that she admits the full personhood of the fetus. She doesn't think the fetus is actually a person, but she says, well, for the sake of argument, fine. Fetus is a person. I'll grant that to you, right? And so the analog to the fetus in the violinist scenario is a violinist, clearly a person with the right to life, yeah? So how are George and Lee going to respond to this argument, which concedes that the fetus is a person, but then nonetheless argues that abortion is impermissible. <clears throat> George and Lee, uh, so we saw how uh, Singer responded, right? We, Singer didn't think this argument worked. He thought the intuition was false. George and Lee are happy to grant the intuition. Sure, fine, it'd be permissible to unplug yourself from the violinist. George and Lee deny that that scenario and intuition have anything to tell us about abortion. They deny the application of that scenario and that intuition to the case of pregnancy and abortion. They claim, they argue that the case of the violinist and pregnancy are disanalogous. And they would say the same thing about the people seeds example. Uh, that's disanalogous from pregnancy. The intuition doesn't apply. The two things are disanalogous. And George and Lee are going to say, uh, they're going to kind of take the uh, avenue that Thompson herself suggests that uh, an objector to her argument might take. George and Lee claim the main disanalogy is that in the case of a pregnancy, the woman is the mother of the fetus. And in the case of the violinist, they just a total stranger. There's no biological relationship there. There's no parental relationship there. <clears throat> That's a moral, uh, morally relevant disanalogy between the two cases, according to George and Lee. Now, Thompson herself anticipates this kind of objection and offers this reply. She says, well, surely we don't have any special responsibility for a person unless we have assumed it. 
either explicitly or implicitly, right? And so her idea is the mother doesn't have any special responsibility for the fetus merely in virtue of being the fetus's mother. It's only if the woman voluntarily accepts that relationship or voluntarily accepts or assumes a special responsibility uh, for the fetus. It's only then that the mother has a special responsibility to uh, care for the uh, fetus and baby and so on. Only if it's voluntarily assumed or accepted does the woman come to have a special responsibility, right? That's what George and Lee are going to argue against. They think that this is where Thompson goes wrong. So she, she goes wrong uh, in thinking these two things are disanalogous. Thompson herself offers a kind of reply saying, well, no, look, uh, um, the biological relationship of motherhood doesn't generate a special responsibility like this. That's where George and Lee think she goes wrong. They think the biological relationship does indeed generate um, a special responsibility, regardless of whether or not the woman has accepted it voluntarily, voluntarily accepted that relationship, voluntarily accepted a special responsibility for the fetus. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I hope you can see how it is that Thompson's move would help disarm this kind of objection, uh, because the objection is saying something like, these two cases are disanalogous because in virtue of being the mother, the woman automatically has a special responsibility for the fetus, whereas the, woman, the person in the violinist scenario doesn't have any special responsibility for the violinist. Thompson is saying, well, no, 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 not so quick. Uh, they still are analogous uh, because you only have a special responsibility if you've assumed it. And so in the case of most abortions, right, the woman has not assumed any special responsibility uh, for the fetus. And so the violinist case and the case of your pregnancy that might end in an abortion, they are in fact analogous. There is no special responsibility because the woman hasn't assumed it. That's Thompson. That's how she's thinking about things. So let's consider now how exactly George and Lee try to make their case. They claim that <clears throat> They claim that the parental relationship itself, not just the voluntary acceptance of that relationship, gives rise to a special responsibility to the child, right? And that's what I've already said. That's their view. So this is really the point of disagreement between Thompson and George and Lee. Well, why do they think that? What kind of argument do they give? They give us an example. It's an example of leaving a baby in the woods. They use this example to try to support this claim up there that the parental relationship itself gives rise to a special responsibility of the child. So the example goes some, something like this. Let's say you have a, a woman who is pregnant, uh, and this is in a different society where things are very different over there. Uh, and let's say in this society that this woman is in, um, either there's no one around to perform an abortion, or she doesn't have money to, uh, but for whatever reason, doesn't really matter for the sake of this example, this leaving the baby in the woods example, but for whatever reason, she is simply unable to get an abortion. She's unable to, to have an abortion. She would like to, she prefers to, she'd rather have an abortion, but it just can't be done, right? She doesn't have access to it. She doesn't have money, whatever, okay? Moreover, and so she carries the baby to term, yeah, because she can't procure an abortion anywhere. She didn't have the financial means, there's no one to do it, can't do it, okay. Moreover, let's say in this society, there is, uh, there is not, uh, uh, there are not people looking to adopt babies, right? So this is different from our own society and our society, there's a fairly long wait list, uh, if you'd like to adopt a, a newborn, if you'd like to adopt a baby, you gotta wait in the line. Um, the demand is greater than the supply, so to speak, to use economic terms. 
in this imaginary society, this example we're considering, um, there's no one around. There's no, nobody would adopt the baby, right? And so they can't put, so this woman can't put the baby up for adoption. She'd rather have an abortion, can't get it. She'd rather let the baby, you know, put it up for adoption, can't do that, right? There's no one there to adopt the baby, say. There are no adoption agencies and nobody willing to uh, take the baby in. And moreover, let's say that uh, if the woman just abandons the baby in the hospital, say, or on the corner or whatever, and the baby is found, well, it'll be returned to her, right? So if she tries to abandon the baby, uh, you know, on someone's doorstep or whatever, like you see in movies, um, that won't work. Uh, it'll just be returned to her, right? If she abandons the baby in a place where other people will find it, it's just coming back to her, right? Assume that. So she'd rather have an abortion, but she can't. She'd rather put the baby up for adoption, but no one's there to adopt. And if she just tries to foist the baby onto somebody else, they'll just give it back. It's coming back to her, yeah? In such a scenario, uh, we can assume, George and Lee say, that this woman has not voluntarily accepted the parental relationship. She has neither implicitly nor explicitly uh, assumed a special responsibility for the fetus, for the baby, when the baby is born now, right? She has not accepted the parental relationship. She, she, she would have done anything to kind of get out of it, to not have the baby with her, uh, but there were no avenues open to her. So she hasn't voluntarily accepted the relationship with the baby. George and Lee now ask, could this woman just abandon the baby in the woods? That is to say, abandon the baby somewhere where it won't be found? Because if it's found, it's just going to be returned to her. And she's going to have to take care of it or something. Uh, can this woman just abandon the baby someplace it won't be found now? Right, and presumably then it won't be taken care of and it will die of exposure or whatever, right? Is that acceptable? I mean, she hasn't accepted, uh, a vo she hasn't voluntarily accepted a special responsibility for it after all. And so um, according to Thompson's view, she should stand in the same kind of relationship to this baby that she just had to any other baby. And she doesn't have to take care of any other baby. It's not her responsibility to make sure these other babies get fed. She hasn't voluntarily accepted special responsibility for her own baby. And so why does she have to, why is it her obligation to take care of the baby, to make sure it gets fed it? According to Thompson's view, George and Lee are arguing, it wouldn't be. It would be permissible, according to Thompson's view, for this woman to simply abandon the baby somewhere where it won't be found. That's what George and Lee are arguing. That's clearly false, however, George and Lee claim. It's clearly not okay for this woman to just abandon the baby and expose it to the elements even though she has not voluntarily accepted the relationship with this baby. Why is it not okay? George and Lee would say, because she is the baby's mother. She has a special responsibility for the baby simply in virtue of being the baby's mother. And so this example of this kind of imaginary society is supposed to show that it's not the voluntary acceptance of this relationship. It's the mere biological relationship itself, the mere fact that this is the baby's mother that generates an obligation to care for and look after the baby. And so this is supposed to be a sign, according to George and Lee, that uh, uh, the parental relationship itself generates uh, a special responsibility to look after uh, the child, look after, I don't know what you call it, offspring, progeny, the fetus, the embryo, whatever it might be, the baby, the child, yeah? Another, I mean, so this is a kind of like, well, imagine a society where, and then we get all these stipulations, it's kind of like, well, I don't know, okay. Here's a little bit more realistic of example, right? It's not so far-fetched. 
Um, not that this leaving the baby in the woods example is the most far-fetched thing we've looked at. We've read that Thompson article. Those examples are way more far-fetched, but whatever. Uh, here's another example. This is drawn from a different author. This isn't in George and Lee. This is, by, uh, this is in a book by a guy named Francis Beckwith, who's also he's a philosophy professor at um, Baylor. Um, he wrote a book, 2007. He gives an example. So he's arguing along uh, similar lines of George and Lee attacking Thompson's, criticizing a Thompson's uh, 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 argument, violinist argument. And instead of using an example like of this uh, baby in a woods or something like that, he uses an example of what we might call deadbeat dads. Right? <clears throat> and so his example is something like this. If Thompson is right about where parental obligations come from, what the source of our parental obligations are, right? And according to Thompson, the source of parental obligations is the voluntary acceptance of the relationship of those obligations, right? The voluntary acceptance of uh, a special responsibility. If that's right, well then um, it would be totally morally permissible uh, the, the, being a deadbeat dad would be totally morally permissible, right? So you're, uh, so take the, you know, take the example of a, a, a father of a male, the man who does this, right? Um, <clears throat> impregnates a woman, woman say wants to keep the baby, have the baby, and she does. And there's the baby now, and she wants, some sort of support, you know, maybe she'd want the father to be around and be involved in the baby's life. Uh, maybe she'd, uh, you know, want him to move in. Maybe she just want to, um, uh, maybe she just wants uh, kind of financial support or, or whatever, right? Any kind of support. Uh, but maybe she wants the, the father to um, uh, do some kind of fathering, however minimal. Well, if Thompson is right about where parental obligations come from, the man who says, no, I don't, nope, I'm not paying child support. I'm not going to be involved at all in this kid's life. Even if you want me to be, I'm not even going to pay child support, even if the court orders me, because I have not voluntarily accepted this relationship. I wanted you, let's say this is his thinking, right? I wanted you to have an abortion. You didn't want to. Well, fine. That was your choice. But I didn't want to be a father. I didn't voluntarily accept fatherhood. Uh, and so I have absolutely no obligations to this child. I'm not going to be involved at all. I'm not going to pay child support. That would be, if Thompson were right, Beckwith argues, uh, that would be morally justifiable. That would be morally legitimate. The father, the deadbeat dad, whatever, would be correct. He doesn't have any special responsibility or obligations to that child, even though he fathered it. Right. And so if a court did order him to pay child support, that would actually be immoral. That would be forcing him to do something that he ought not be forced to do because he never voluntarily accepted the relationship. And so according to Beckwith, this again shows that Thompson's account of where parental obligations come from is wrong. Because Beckwith would want to say the father in this case has obligations to that child regardless of whether he accepted them, right? So even though he wanted the woman to get abortion, uh, an abortion, even though he didn't want to be a father, he didn't want any of them, right? Even though that's true, he's, he's still the father. He still has a responsibility for that child. And so if that means, you know, whatever, part-time custody, if that means child support, whatever, that's what he'd be required to do because he has a special responsibility for the, for the child just in virtue of being its parent. That's what Beckwith argues. And he claims Thompson's view gets that wrong, right? Doesn't have that, uh, doesn't have the right implications here. And so that's a reason to reject Thompson's view of the source of parental obligations. Right? Beckwith is arguing that our parental obligations come merely from the parental relationship itself, not from the voluntary uh, acceptance of it. 
Now, back to George and Lee. What George and Lee are actually really, uh, what they're really good about here is recognizing that this difference between them and Thompson is, the, is, a, is a kind of symptom of a much greater difference between them and Thompson. And this greater difference has to do with the kind of nature of human beings and the source of our obligations to one another. Where do, why am I obligated to do anything for other people? <clears throat> what is the source of my obligations to others? And according to Thompson, or Thompson's view would hold that it has to come some way or bottom out in my acceptance of responsibility to other people. I have to accept these obligations to others, right? And so if I don't accept any, I'm not gonna have that many, right? George and Lee, by contrast, wanna say that the source of our obligations to others, they may come from accepting obligations, right? So um, I am obligated to uh, whatever grade your work and give you feedback and so and things like that because I have voluntarily accepted this position as instructor and so on. I've voluntarily accepted those responsibilities. So yeah, so maybe some responsibility to other people's come like that. But really the kind of most fundamental ones and the most important responsibilities we have do not come about like that at all. Right? You have uh, when you're a child, you have certain responsibilities and obligations to your parents. Right? You 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 have to respect them and listen to them and whatever and so on and you know, clean your room. That's not, you didn't voluntarily accept that at all, right? Uh, you didn't accept anything. And yet you have those, you have those obligations. More generally, when you're born into the kind of human community, even if you didn't accept it at all, you don't have any say about it, about being born into the human community, about being born into this or that family. But when you're born into the human community, Simply in virtue of which you don't it never necessarily voluntarily accept it, but simply in virtue of being born into that community, you're going to have certain obligations and responsibilities to other people. That's George and Lee's view. It's a view about the nature of the human being and the source of our obligations to others. And they are at odds with Thompson. George and Lee's view is kind of what we might call more classical. Um, it owes uh, certain debts to philosophers like Aristotle, um, whereas Thompson's view is more modern, um, drawn more from people like Locke. These are fundamental differences in philosophy differences over human nature and the source of moral obligation. That's really the point I want to draw out of this. So like what we saw earlier with Singer, that there were these really fundamental deep differences over the philosophy of mind. Well, here now in the reply to Thompson, we have these really deep disagreements over human nature and the source of moral obligation. And so while the abortion debate, yeah, that looks like a really bad disagreement, on the surface, yeah, it looks like that, right? You have these two sides. But okay, you dig down a little bit deeper, and there's even greater disagreement, right? Same kind of point holds here as held when we were talking about Singer. That's not to say that George and Lee are wrong or that Thompson is wrong or anything like that. Um, all I want to point out now is that there's this huge fundamental philosophical disagreement between these various positions. Um, and it's not just between pro-life and pro-choice, uh, it's also between um, people within the same side of things, right? So Thompson and Singer, for example, fundamentally disagree. We're going to start talking about this more, the, the kind of nature of these debates and the disagreements that lie behind them. We're going to talk about this more as we proceed.